Welcome, everybody. Thanks for, for coming, especially around lunchtime. I appreciate it. We've got three wonderful visitors that came all the way from the Netherlands to speak with us today and, and to visit us. Um, so I'd love to introduce Nadina, Jim, Chris from the Global Green City Watch team, now called Green City Watch, as I just found out. Um, so they are the overall winners from the challenge that we ran earlier this year, our GBDX for Sustainability Challenge, where we had a call um, for open submissions for ideas of how organizations, any organization, for-profit, non-profit, you name it, um, could use GBDX in support of the sustainable development goals, these 17 goals that have been adopted by the UN to kind of guide our global agenda between now and 2030. <clears throat> and the SDGs are really ambitious. They have things from ending poverty to ending food security to women's equality to um, improving life on land and conservation and, and making sure that we're, we're living um, sustainable. And so the Global Green City Watch team, the Green City Watch team was our overall winner. They beat out some really impressive teams um, and have an incredible project that they're, they're going to speak more to today and explain kind of their trajectory, um, not only since they, they won the challenge and what they were able to do with GBDX, but um, also what they're doing today and, and some of the projects that they've been working on more recently. So it's please uh, give a big round of applause and welcome to uh, Global Green City Watch and the team here. Thanks. <laughs> Hi everyone, great to be here today. Um, as Raynan said, Jim, Chris and I flew in uh, from Amsterdam last night just to be here today with all of you. And I have to say, since we won the GBDX for Sustainability Challenge, I was just saying to Rhiannon, we've kind of been on a high for the past six months. Um, and it's really nice to finally be here at Digital Globe headquarters, somewhat of a, of a, a nerdy dream come true for the three of us, and be able to, uh, to share a story with you here uh, today. So uh, it's an honor to be here. Thank you. Uh, a little bit about me personally, just to start us off with. Um, as Rhiannon said, my name is Nadina, and uh, for me, uh, my story starts 20 years ago, growing up in southwestern Ontario, uh, not far from here, and, uh, and really seeing, always being fascinated by biology and environmental sciences, but really seeing urban sprawl, much like you see here in Westminster and across Colorado, kind of slowly take over, right? So this horizontal sprawl that we all, uh, all know here, especially in North America. And it got me wondering, you know, why, why does it have to be this way? Why do we have to develop cities in this way? Why does, you know, why is my supermarket only a kilometer away from me, but why is there not a sidewalk for me to be able to walk there? I'm sure we've all felt this frustration at some point in our lives growing up in North America. Um, it led me to study earth sciences to try and understand um, how really the earth came to be and how it functions, but also really to gain a deeper understanding of what we can do to protect it in the current uh, uh, you know, in current environment of climate change and, and things of that nature. And eventually led me to pursue a PhD in something called ecological engineering, which is a rapidly developing new field, which basically integrates ecology, the best of ecology and the best of engineering, to try and basically monitor, design, and repair and restore uh, better ecosystems that benefit both nature and people. And specifically, I'm looking at how uh, smart, uh, data-driven new technologies um, like high resolution satellite imagery, for example, can help us uh, gain, um, basically help us achieve the goal of renaturing our cities and bringing nature back into these important areas. I'm uh, doing my PhD based in Amsterdam, but doing my PhD at University College Dublin and Trinity College Dublin under Horizon uh, 2020, which is a European funded project called Connecting Nature. The GBDX for Sustainability Challenge is the reason why we stand here in front of you today. Um, it was Chris, who's going to speak after me, who, who came across this challenge and brought uh, the four of us uh, together to work on it. We're all um, remote sensing geeks in our own right, um, but this, so this really got us uh, excited, um, not only to be able to apply geospatial big data in an, uh, in an innovative way, but also really um, what really drives my passion is uh, to be able to use them for sustainable development as outlined by these different goals. What we developed was an objective way to monitor the quality of urban green spaces and cities and other urban ecosystems in a resource efficient and inexpensive way. The key here is the quality of green space, something that's quite new to this field. The focus has mainly been on quantity so far, 
And we um, were really faced with the question of, you know, what if you could use an objective means, like a satellite image, um, of technology and be able to say, okay, you know, this is how we can monitor quality, which of course is quite a subjective thing. You know, what would that, what would that look like? Um, our solution, um, what we hope is to be more accurate than on the field uh, monitoring, a lot more research efficient for those um, same reasons and, and cost effective and basically being able to monitor these urban ecosystems in, in almost near real time, save money and reduce inefficiencies for municipalities and other green space uh, custodians and eventually really uh, lead to evidence-based action plans for how we can better the quality of green spaces in our cities. When I say we, we did it with the four of us. Uh, so Chris, Jim and I who are here today, uh, and Angelica, um, who is actually the only American on our team but could not be here today unfortunately with us. Um, and we all really carry, uh, we're all alumni from the University of Amsterdam, that's where we all met. We all did the masters in earth sciences. And we, uh, even though we did the same masters program, we all really have our distinct uh, specializations. Chris is our data scientist or data optimist, as he will tell you about later. Uh, my focus, as I mentioned already, is, um, is in ecological engineering with the focus on urban ecology. So really understanding what ecology means for city and uh, you know, everything from what kind of tree species work best to soak up the most storm water. Um, what can different uh, placement of different trees mean, both socially and economically, and all these different kinds of questions. Uh, Jim is our remote sensing and, and GIS specialist. And uh, Angelica has, uh, through a lot, a lot of her work, has been focused on the SDGs, which has made her such a valuable addition to our team. So as Richard Branson once said, the very best ideas are born out of frustration. And man, are we frustrated. Uh, tree cover in urban areas, as you may or may not know, uh, in the US at least, has declined uh, by some 175,000 acres uh, in the last decade. And you can see that a lot of that change, most notably, has been happening on the East Coast. But it's not just uh, across the US, it's also in our home city in Amsterdam, where green space has decreased by 11% in the past 13 years. And the interesting thing here is uh, Amsterdam has seen rapid um, we are now in the top five most expensive housing markets in the world, I believe, or at least in the top 10. And what you can see here is that um, the green space that has actually been diminished is not so much parks, but it's green areas that you know, weren't necessarily designated as parks. And these are exactly the green areas that are most vulnerable in our cities. So these have basically been replaced by uh, development and by construction, things of this nature. And it's really important that we protect these because, um, well, it's not as well mapped out how, just how important these uh, places are to the, people, uh, to the people living around them. The importance of green space. Um, how many of you here, just a raise of hands, live in what you would consider to be a city? So really the most of you. And how many of you go to an urban green space um, weekly, would you say, to a park? So also the most of you. And I think if I were to tell you, you know, if these green spaces were to disappear, um, you know, you might feel a certain emotional attachment to those green spaces. And it's because um, they're not only, it, the thing about the urban green spaces is they're not only so important, but they're so important across so many different parameters, right? So it's not just an ecological function that they serve, which is a very important one, you know, protecting biodiversity in our cities, making sure that, um, uh, the, we have areas that can intercept uh, storm water, as, um, especially that we've seen, you know, if you look past uh, 2017 and you look at, for example, uh, Hurricane Harvey in, uh, in Houston, for example. Um, well, that's a longer story. But, uh, you know, it can also do things like f filtering um, air pollutants, uh, improving the air quality. Um, but I, for me, it's, this, it's the social impacts that are so interesting as well. And there's a lot of new research that has come out to, to show these different things. You know, it can reduce stress levels just by taking a 15-minute walk through the park. Uh, it can reduce obesity levels by making sure people have the means and the areas to get out and be more physically active. And all these other things economically, raising neighborhood property values. There was a really interesting study that came out of uh, Penn State recently where they did a, a case study across, um, across Philadelphia where they basically they took uh, vacant lots 
in some neighborhoods that had a lower socioeconomic status. They took some vacant lots and they greened them, but in varying degrees. Some of them it would just mean cleaning up the trash, some of them it would mean planting trees, some it meant you know, putting in a bench and some gardening and stuff like that. And in all of those things, even with the most, um, what the most interesting was is you saw this, this, um, this causation pattern of when people lived in these areas that were uh, the most greenified, if you will, they had um, the high, they reported the highest levels of feeling less stressed out, reported higher well-being, and all these things. And we're talking about lots that are maybe you know a hundred square meters. Oh, sorry, I don't know what that is in feet. Um, a hundred square meters, so it's, you know a relatively small area. And it just goes to show uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be about you know building a central park on every corner. You know it can be something as small as just renaturing these small little areas. And what an impact they can have already. The problem is, is that when you look at uh, city budgets for urban green spaces, there's, there's a key aspect missing. As you can see, about 75% of a city's uh, budget is, uh, goes to, not surprisingly, maintenance, right? So city pruning, uh, sorry, tree pruning, uh, tree removal, supervision of these different tasks. Um, but then if you look at the very top here, Inventory and analysis, of course, there's some other costs here related to administration, of course, needs to happen, public ed education, a shocking 1%. <laughs> um, but if you look, for example, the inventory and analysis, this was the only category that I could find that you know, would maybe include quality monitoring as we've defined it. But you know, who knows if that's even really included in this, in this one, uh, in this one uh, section. And even if it is, it's only 1.8%. Uh, you know, and the thing is, the reason why probably is to do quality monitoring by hand uh, can be extremely expensive. I took, uh, for example, if you take a day rate of $1,000 and you say that um, uh, in a landscape architect or um, uh, a tree uh, taxation officer, for example, could cover, let's say, a hectare or maybe max five hectares a day. Um, for $1,000 a day, then you would get to around these costs that it would take to monitor all the green spaces in these different cities by hand. So for cities like Singapore and Vienna, you're looking at you know, upwards of $20 million a year to be able to monitor the quality of all these uh, cities, green spaces. So what ends up happening um, is that it just doesn't happen, right? They say, well, you know, we, we definitely cannot afford this, and therefore it doesn't happen. Green space quality suffers, and the people living uh, around these areas and visiting these areas also suffer. Why now? Well, as we just saw by the raise of hands before, um, we have far surpassed uh, the amount of people living in urban areas than do in rural. So it was a, a, you know, just a decade, or a decade ago where uh, over 50% of people were living in cities. Now, going closer to 2030, that's, uh, that's going to reach 63% globally, people living in cities. In, in Europe, where we're from, um, you know, that, that is already at 85% of people living in cities in an urbanized area. And you even have it, uh, the UN says that 3 million people are moving to cities every single week, which I think really kind of brings into perspective just how many people are going to be calling cities home in the next coming years. And this is, of course, only expected to increase. And as such, um, I believe that, that cities are really, um, can be really the catalyst, right? So if, because this is where, uh, where if you, I use a lot of systems thinking principles in my work, and in systems thinking, uh, you, can, uh, you have these things called leverage points. And leverage points are areas within a system where for the minimal amount of impact, uh, sorry, of effort, you can have the most amount of impact. And cities are an ideal leverage point, right? If you can make uh, small steps for sustainability in cities, you can make huge steps for sustainability worldwide. And that's something that, you know, I'm not alone in that. You have a lot of um, organizations, American ones especially, like that 100 Resilient Cities by the Rockefeller Foundation, um, which basically sponsors uh, 100 cities to hire a chief resilience officer in their city governments. You also have C40, the Climate Leadership Group, uh, which was started by um, Michael Bloomberg and a whole handful of uh, former mayors from big cities. You have the World Resources Institute. Uh, they also have a Center for Sustainable Cities. And of course, the Sustainable Development Goal. Um, one of the 17 goals is number 11, uh, which is specifically focused on sustainable cities and communities. And what I like about um, goal number 11 is if you actually look at their vision, and this is gonna be a little bit small, but if you look, this is the, the graphic that they've used, right, to describe goal number 11. 
And if you look at, you know, this is just on an infographic, a little pictogram, you can see that a tree plays a role in almost every single infographic here. And I just thought that was so interesting because even though one of the sub goals is to provide uh, safe and inclusive urban green spaces uh, for their citizens in these cities, I thought it was so interesting that even at such a simple level of an, of an infographic, the tree plays such an important role. Um, but you don't just have to take my word for it and these organizations' word for it. Even the, the, the regional office uh, for Europe by the World Health Organization in a 2016 report, which was specifically on uh, urban green spaces, they, in direct quote, they said, we have a serious lack of and an urgent need for investment uh, into monitoring tools for uh, green space managers. So this really shows, you know, um, this is not just our frustration. Uh, it's even at, at something like the level of the World Health Organization. They're saying just how important it is. And you would think, you know, 2016, why is it that we don't really have a monitoring tool yet? And that's because most of them has been focused on either in situ field observations, uh, field surveys, um, and things of that nature, right? It's all things which I, I showed in a previous slide uh, can add up to be quite expensive. Um, but expensive isn't ne nearly always the problem because in the last um, year, um, the Trust for Public Land, an organization that you may be familiar with here in the States, um, they were able to calculate that in the last year alone, they had a 6% increase in public spending for urban green spaces. 6% in just one year. That's an increase of, of, um, of just over $400 million. And it just goes to show just um, how well the message is getting across that these, uh, that these spaces are so important in our cities. And on the complete other side of the spectrum, uh, not just talking about urban green spaces, but also big data as a service, right? Which is essentially what our product is. Um, that's a market that's expected to reach uh, over $120 billion by uh, 2025 with a, a compound annual growth rate of 15% in the coming years. So for who? For who is Green City Watch? And who did we create this for? And who did we have in mind? Um, well, that's, of course, the citizens, right? It's, it's to all of you who raised your hand saying that you go to, a, to, go to one of your urban parks, an urban green space, uh, within a week, you know, it, on a weekly basis. That's who it's for. Um, and for us, what's most important is that it's not just about the central parks. You know, it's not just about improving the central parks. I'm sure there can be improvements made to even to central park, but it's about, you know, the not so central parks. It's about those urban green spaces that are maybe on the fringes of the city, but uh, where their need for them is even greater. Um, those are, of course, the primary beneficiaries of Green City Watch. But in terms of who uh, the tool is actually directed for, uh, those are, of course, municipalities, our first uh, target audience, city governments, um, where we can hopefully uh, find a way into uh, expanding that 1.28% of the city budget a little bit more to include us, uh, the urban-focused international organizations like C40 and like um, the Ross Center for Sustainable Cities, or like the World Bank, um, who we've been working with uh, recently as well. Uh, and number three would be uh, kind of one that you wouldn't expect, but there are organizations, especially housing corporations, real estate organizations, uh, university campuses uh, that manage a lot of these green spaces, right? And a lot of time in urban centers who would also be interested. Uh, in the last, well, really six months since we won and, and, and 10 months uh, since we started, um, just uh, exactly a year ago, the GBDX for Sustainability Challenge was uh, open to the public. When we submitted in January, we found out we were a top finalist. Uh, then we got uh, two months access to the GBDX platform to work out our tool. And then when we actually won, like I said in the beginning, we're still kind of on a high because um, you know, we're, we're four friends from Amsterdam that, you know, we're doing this and programming this and building this with beer and pizza in the evenings and in the weekends up against teams from Duke and Oxford and UNICEF. And, um, yeah, it was just fantastic to be able to see that there's uh, such an appreciation for, for this really important topic. In June, Chris got to visit uh, the World Bank to present our project, and from there has, uh, has led to a, um, a collaboration with the World Bank, which Chris will elaborate on. Um, in October, we were a top finalist for the University of Amsterdam Alumni Award. And then in 2019, as we go forward into the new year, we would love to, of course, work with um, a lot more city clients. In uh, these last couple months as well, we've been honored to be, uh, be featured by a number of different organizations that I won't all get into, some Dutch, uh, some international. 
uh, Amazon Web Services, which was um, one of the co-writers of the challenge as well, um, featured us in a blog post um, recently, a week ago. We were featured by um, what you could say is the New York Times of Italy, which was quite fun. <laughs> and um, uh, what was also nice uh, to see is, I, I checked this recently, but we've had about 2,000 unique visitors to our uh, site, greencitywatch.org, which has a fun demo tool that you can all try um, as well. And uh, the Dutch government, this picture here, the Dutch government uh, named us as one of the top 200 solutions to basically lead the energy transition as well in the Netherlands, which is a, which is a big topic over there. We've got to present all over the world uh, in the last couple of months, which has been really interesting. Uh, Chris was able to travel to uh, the World Bank in, um, uh, in June. Um, uh, one of the people that we're working with from the World Bank, he's the uh, special assistant to the Vice President of Sustainable Development, Charles Fox. He was able to present on our behalf at the Mapathon and also the State of the Map uh, US conference in Detroit this past year. I was in Italy two weeks ago for the World Forum on Urban Forests, the first ever. Yeah, that exists. I know I was also shocked. Um, we got to do a, uh, a webinar for the ICLE World Conference, uh, which happened in June this past month. And Chris has also been able to do a, uh, a webinar for the Digital Globe Partner Series as well. Now I want to hand it over to, uh, to Chris. I hope that's given you an overview of, of why we do what we do and where we've gotten to this point. And Chris will take you through some of the more technical details of Green City Watch. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nadine. And thanks uh, to Digital Globe for having us. I'm very excited to be here and talk a little bit about, I think, what is one of the coolest projects I've worked on uh, in the past couple of years. Uh, can anyone, uh, does anyone recognize this place? I guess not. <laughs> this is what we could call the Central Park of Amsterdam. And a couple of weeks ago, I, I went uh, to uh, Marike, the, deputy um, mayor of uh, sustainability in Amsterdam and asked her uh, how do you how do you define uh, quality of uh, of your parks in Amsterdam and she actually told she she looked at me and she she didn't re really reply and she said actually we we don't really have a very good method to measure the quality of urban green space and that struck me as very uh, interesting because it made me sure that we were working on something that could benefit people who live in cities um, uh, so I'm Chris, I, I worked, uh, I'm working as a data scientist at, uh, in Amsterdam and I'm also trained like these guys in the earth sciences and I like to, Nadine already said it, I like to think of myself as a data optimist. So we have seen in the last couple of years that in transparency in the use of data can lead to very yeah, questionable developments. But I believe that we can also use data and algorithms and data analysis to actually increase transparency uh, for in, in like government and whatever. So I think this is like a very cool first tiny little step to reach, reach that goal in which we can use all these new exciting technology to make a better, slightly better world. Uh, so being uh, scientifically educated, we wanted to so we had a huge, big, interesting data set, and we had to fix problems. So we wanted first to go uh, think of a process in which we could do this. So we wanted to start with an ev evidence-based econo economically sound indicator. So how are you gonna measure something so subjective in an objective way? And we thought, okay, the research that is already done is probably the best way to start. Then we have uh, data, very high resolution satellite imagery that's uh, originated from your cell lights. And we also wanted to include a, a, an open data source where actually people are uh, the ones who are making the data so they can also be a bit more involved. So that's the OpenStreetMap that's also provided through the GBDX uh, platform. And then we have uh, the algorithms we use to get actually the interesting information from the data. And we need to think about how we're gonna present these data to, to the users, to the municipalities, and also to citizens. So that's the process I will take you through how we went through those steps. So first we have 40 years of research, and one of the interesting ones is uh, by um, Marcus and Barnes in the 90s, where they researched um, 
people in hospitals that had a view uh, to the parking lot and people in hospitals who had a view to a beautiful park. And they actually saw that people who uh, have a view to a park have a way uh, faster rate of recovery. And we use these kind of studies as basis for the indicators that we wanted to measure from space. Um, so we divided the, those in three basic categories, and that is an economic indicators like how much does it contribute to tourist spending, does it, how much does it increase the property values around. Uh, we have social indicators, uh, so what I just talked about, about uh, mental health or actually phys physical health. Um, we have ecological indicators like uh, the biodiversity or uh, reducing uh, heat island effect or the infiltration capacity. And uh, from those indicators, we thought, okay, we have these indicators, but what, which things can we measure from space that will explain something about these indicators? So for instance, temperature regulation, the measuring the leaf area index from space could tell you something about the, uh, the potential for a park to mitigate uh, temperature fluctuations. Also, we saw that research showed that um, water bodies that are wider than 50 meters have a measurable effect on the temperature. So these are things that you can actually measure from space and based on a range of these indicators, we build our indicator framework. Also, what I also already said a little bit is that we wanted to include the public in, in the product. So it actually, uh, people can contribute to the quality of the analysis and also making them invested, invested in, in the development of, of the data and uh, in the process of uh, decision making by the government. So we see that 66% of US citizens don't feel themselves hurt in local decision making. So in that way, uh, by using the open street map, we hope we could increase that a little bit. And this is interesting uh, about the OpenStreetMap. It actually uh, has little polygons of areas and it's, it's marked as being grass or being trees. And that's interesting for us because we can use that for the training of our machine learning algorithms. So here uh, on the right, uh, we see in, in the red line, you see, yeah, you can see it. Uh, you see the area that's marked as being grass. And we can take the, uh, the signal that's in all these individual pic pixels, and we put them in our algorithm, we train it a little bit, and then if we put in a new pixel, we can actually say, okay, it's grass, or it's, it's, it's a tree, or it is water. So a little bit of machine learning for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and what does it look like? This is a beautiful park in, uh, or is it? It's a nice park in, in Jakarta, Indonesia. And if we apply the analysis, we get something like this. So here we see the purple area. We also get the outline of the parks from the OpenStreetMap. And here we do, yeah, uh, the purple is outside of the park. And in red, we see impermeable surfaces. And the green and the dark green is grass and trees. So this, this analysis can uh, teach us about um, the ratio between build up area and uh, green area. So that's one of our indicators. So where are we going to apply this? <laughs> so for the, for the G, uh, GBDX, for the sustainability challenge, uh, we picked uh, four cities and we run the analysis on it and we built a interface that you can uh, look up online. You can actually check it out and it's, it's like a first draft of what we hope to be an iterative pro process in which we can make better and better product that actually helps citizens and the government to, um, to see what, what we measured. So here you see in, in green, like good parks and in red, uh, less good parks. And then it also shows you uh, the, the measurements that we did. So that's the first try, and I think we got already some feedback uh, from governments and users, and we'll, we'll still, we're still improving on, on this as we speak. Um, so that's the first one we did. Then, we, then uh, we talked to the World Bank, and we presented what we had so far, and they said, okay, that's interesting. Let's have a look if we can apply it in a real case scenario. So 
they went to uh, Tbilisi and we did the analysis for them. And uh, Charles Fox from the World Bank worked with us and I, we did our analysis and he did his analysis and together it, we developed these kinds of maps where we can show, uh, so this is the green, green area in the riparian zone, that's one of the indicators. And we showed this to the mayor of Tbilisi and he actually used uh, this information to now build uh, three extra parks uh, in the Tbilisi area, which is a pretty uh, cool feat, I think. Uh, and then, uh, so they were quite happy about it, I think. And then we went on to analyze uh, 26 cities in Indonesia. Uh, we, did, we just uh, finished up uh, with the analysis and handed in the data. So we're still waiting on how happy they are uh, this time or not, <laughs> we'll see. So that's actually interesting. So there's 12, more than 12 million people. That's twice all the people in uh, Colorado that live in these 26 cities. So that's quite an impact. And um, this is one of the examples I already showed you. So we, this is kind of what we delivered uh, to, to the World Bank who are going, going to talk to the, um, the people who run the cities in Indonesia. And we hope that this can help them understand what we're actually measuring and how we're, how we're getting to that point. And this is just another example of, an, of a park in Indonesia that we analyzed. Um, yeah, so some next steps. So I think we did some cool stuff already, but of course we want to take it further. Uh, not everything can be measured from space, unfortunately. So we wanted to uh, incorporate also some sentiment analysis on uh, social data. Uh, we're working together with, uh, with oh yeah, we, we use the TripAdvisor data for that. Uh, we also want to include the citywide indicators. So for now we're focusing on parks, but we think it's very important to also look at uh, like a general green area, uh, yeah, the distribution of green over the whole city. Uh, we also want to, uh, we're going to collaborate actually uh, in September with uh, MIT's uh, Sensible City Lab. That's uh, Nadine's uh, effort, very nice. I'm, I'm looking forward to that with their Tripedia. I, I hope we can incorporate some of our uh, data sources. And then of course we hope to continue our partnership with Digital Globe because yeah, that's, this is the coolest data that I've worked with and I hope we can continue, uh, can you continue that collaboration. And I hope that, uh, so being the optimist, I hope we can provide all the people, in the, people who are living in urban areas in the world with, with that walk that gives them a little bit more and in that way actually um, make people more aware of the nature and of what we have to do to keep it that way. So thank you very much. Also in uh, Cheeseman Park over here in Denver. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, that was what uh, I had to say about it. Are there any questions? <laughs> All right. And I don't know, guys, if we'll be able to take questions from the live stream, but I can manage down here. Hi there. Um, I was wondering if you felt very fortunate when you found that the open space maps already did all the labeling for you, or was there like a plan to do the labeling yourself? And also, does the citywide indicators, do you have to do any different labeling yourself that open space maps doesn't provide for you? Uh, that's a very good question, and I didn't actually touch upon that point, but of course, when you're working with a very big data sets of that you also work with and the, the problem is scaling, right? So you want to be able to do your analysis in, in some city in Indonesia, but also in Detroit. And so in the process of thinking of how are we gonna do this and we found the OpenStreetMap, we were actually very happy. Yes, <laughs> you're right. We were very happy because it, was, it brought two worlds perfectly together. So you have, you have a data set that's already labeled and you have uh, your, your satellite imagery and you have al also the yeah, participation of citizens in that data. Uh, so yeah, that, that, that was uh, pretty cool. <laughs> but uh, a lot of parks in Indonesia, we had to redraw ourselves. Yeah, yeah, they were, they were not there. Yeah, mm -hmm. in these countries, um, a lot of data is not as good as the data we have here in, in, in the Netherlands or uh, America, for example. So you have to do a lot more checking in these countries. Um, yeah, that's the problem that we still have to solve.
Yes. Maybe I can elaborate on that a little bit as well. That's kind of where the collaboration with MIT's Treepedia project came from as well, because uh, MIT, the Sensible City Lab there, has developed this really interesting technique where they can basically assess the green canopy uh, from on the street from Google Map Street View. Um, and that's kind of interesting, right, because it's, it's giving you this on-the-ground perspective, and especially when you're able to match that with the, with the top-down as perspective from satellite imagery, that's kind of where we see the ultimate marriage and harmony between those two different things because of course even though we've tried our best to build out a very comprehensive indicator framework of things that you can see from space of course there's definitely going to be things missing from that um, especially with regards to when it comes to social indicators which I hope in our it both Chris and I's story came across that that's you know the, the social aspect of these parks is, is not to be underestimated how important that is um, so that's why we're also hoping uh, to uh, get sentiment analysis. So basically, for those of you that don't know what that is, that's a way for a computer to essentially read what the sentiment or the, uh, the feeling is behind a piece of text. Uh, so one way to do this is using TripAdvisor reviews that people, you would think they wouldn't write that about parks, but they do, both locals and tourists, and not just, uh, you know, the big parks and, and the touristy parks, uh, but also, you know, even the, the small fringe parks, you can even get, you know, it might just be 20, 30 reviews, but it's something. You can at least get an indication of what people think of those. So when you can really, when it comes to, as you were saying, what kind of other data sets would you need, uh, ideally, I, I would love to see kind of this, uh, this marriage come together of using the TripAdvisor data using the high-res satellite imagery and hopefully it being able to also have this input of, of Google Street View, I think then you've got a really great snapshot of what the green space in your city looks like. <laughs> so I had a, a question as well. Um, so you mentioned that you're taking essentially a, an algorithm uh, in Indonesia and applying it to uh, areas in Detroit, that kind of thing, right? So. Obviously, uh, green spaces are going to vary widely in different, you know, ecosystems. Mm -hmm. uh, so, how are you comparing, you know, what what is considered a, a quality park in, say, a desert area versus a, you know, more tropical area? And on top of that, you know, how do you factor in the, you know, differences in seasonality and that kind of thing? Because that really impacts NDVI and some of these indicators that I'm sure you guys are looking at. Uh, yeah, good question. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so we the the basic indicator framework that we're using, I think, is it it has indicators that are yeah that can be scaled, that are very generic for a lot of areas. But for instance, when we did the Indonesia case, uh, we we saw that there's a lot of bare ground in the in the yeah in the parks basically. So what we did, we actually had to yeah kind of uh, mess, mess a little bit with the indicators and change them a little bit together, talking to, to the people who are the experts on the ground. And I think this is something that you'll always need to do. So in some way it will be scalable, but in, in, in some specifics you have to talk to the people you're working with to actually make it work on the, on the place itself. So that's all, always going to, be, going to be a challenge, but also very interesting, of course. And I think we can provide cities with like a basic indicator framework, a basic idea of quality. And then if you want to dig deeper and make specific, um, yeah, say something specific about that area, you, yeah, you will have to do some uh, tailored analysis. And uh, the machine learning uh, is also locally trained. This is not that we use the data from Indonesia on Detroit. It's always on the, the local cities trained. So that's separate in that sense. And maybe one more final thing to add to that. This was a big ambition that we had originally in our, in our submission for the GBDX for Sustainability Challenge. It, it was to actually come up with an indicator set for different climate zones, just so using the Copen cla climate classifications, saying like, okay, this is the indicator set for that climate zone and, and doing that. And that turned out to be way too much of a huge goal to be able to do that in two months. But I know that's something we still kind of all have in the back of our heads, how amazing that would be. But 
you know, just knowing also out of my own research, knowing that, you know, green is not always good. And I, I saw this in a case study from Lisbon, for example, where they had really high quality green spaces, but they were brown for many months of the year because, well, the city didn't feel like it was a sustainable option to irrigate these different things because they'd had times of drought, you know. And if you look at that and you see only brown, your indicator might say, you know, this is not good, when in fact, actually, it, it might be the highest quality park that Lisbon could have. Hello. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you for what you're doing. It's very impressive. Uh, I have a non-technical question, though. Um, just like I think we all know we need water to live, I think we all realize that we live our best lives in green spaces. So how do you stay motivated when people are like not getting it? Take them on a walk in a park, because <laughs> they clearly need it. <laughs> um, yeah, how do we stay motivated? For, for me, I think it was just, and I think the, the drive that I've always had is seeing the destruction of green spaces and seeing what a, what a negative impact that has, both ecologically and socially speaking, and, and, and knowing what it, what it does for people if you do have those, if you do have those areas. I think that, that was just that, that frustration, seeing that as a kid growing up, I think that's enough drive to keep you motivated for the rest of your life. <laughs> and, and for me, it's, uh, I'm also... Uh, a teacher at the University of Amsterdam nowadays, and I'm uh, teaching at uh, uh, studies called Future Planet Studies. And uh, these are new students, they're, they're working towards um, new solutions to for a better planet in that sense. So that also keeps me motivated to f keep fighting for this better planet and a greener, uh, greener space, of course. Yeah. Uh, I have a, another technical question. Uh, so if I understood correctly, you, you use the OSM to train your classifier, right? Yes. Uh, did you have to deal with any problems of misalignment of OSM and our imagery and how did you solve that problem? Yeah, we, we manually um, uh, go through all the, the training um, polygons and say if it's good training data or bad training data in that sense. And then, yeah, it's quite fun. Yeah, right? yeah, quite <laughs> fun. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we are also still, uh, we're still in development and what we're working on now is, so the idea is that uh, and we're having good prelim preliminary results, but the idea is that if you have like a thousand polygons, uh, which all are grass, then the most of it will be grass. You know, so you can use a, a classifier or a, how do you call it? Yeah, I think it's a, like a DB scan or something. You can use that to, to get actually the biggest amount of data from that set. And well, of course you're gonna have problems, but I'm, I'm pretty confident that we can make something that works 99.9% uh, uh, of the cases. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, so that's the solution for this problem that we're working on now. Hey there, uh, just a quick question on what aspects of GBX did you use? Just kind of curious what tools uh, helped, you know, your training phase or your deployment phase? Uh, yeah, so we, for the OSM we used uh, vector services which was very useful. Uh, but we also use the over, overpass, overpass uh, API. Yes, yeah. And um, we actually, we, so there's of course a lot of algorithms built into the GBDX, but we mostly used uh, open source uh, algorithms like the SK, SK Learn uh, kit and that kind of stuff. That's what we mostly uh, use for this. And the open uh, computer vision uh, algorithms. Also from an idea that, uh, that other people who don't have the same data and not the same platform can also uh, use it in the future without having the uh, proprietary uh, technology. Other questions? And the teams here all day, I've got them in back-to-back -back meetings, but they're free as of four. <laughs> so if there are any longer conversations that we wanna have, we can always make time for that too. Uh, Will, any questions online? No, we're good? Okay, cool. Well, with that, thank you guys. I think fantastic presentation. Thank, thank, you. thank you so much for coming. Big Thanks. round of applause again. Yeah, thank you. That was thank super. You. <laughs>